In the distant past, men of old spoke under the anointing of the Spirit of God. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. But the end is not yet. There will be great signs in the heavens and on the earth, and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them by that which is coming, for the powers of heaven will be shaken. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. His wrath has come, and who is able to stand? World in Focus. Hello, good evening. Thank you for joining us. This is live. It's World in Focus. It's a special program tonight. I have to say that with everything that's happening, we really need to pay attention to what is uh, the significance of Israel in today's world. Uh, I have with me, of course, Pastor Derek Walker, Box of Bible Church. I just want to welcome you, uh, Derek, to this particular special program. I Thank know you, you've Howard. raced here to get here. You've already been teaching this evening, and uh, you're probably in very much demand at the moment because you've got a lot uh, to offer as far as understanding end times and particularly with regards to the prophetic uh, word of God and in particular to with regards to Israel. Now, I wrote something down just a few seconds ago, Derek. I'm going to read it okay. um, because um, my memory isn't that good with COVID and all that. But it says, I've got written down here, significance of why the state of Israel or Israel itself is highly important uh, to uh, the living God and should be significant to the entire world, especially in these days that we live in. Now, Derek, you know, just to nutshell it a little bit, you know, how would you put it that what you're seeing, especially with what's happening uh, between uh, Israel and uh, the Gaza Strip and the Palestinians, the, you know, the, all of the Hamas and, and Iran, I mean, it's an amazing um, time for it to all come out in the open. And this seems to be even more of a mess, if you want to call it that, because of the way in which Israeli Arabs have now entered into the streets and entered almost into um, what could be deemed a civil war in Israel and the Palestinian uh, territories. Yes, that, I mean, that, that would be very um, dangerous for Israel, really, if, if, if it developed into a civil war. It hasn't yet, really, but uh, that, that would be a major problem for Israel. It, it can handle Hamas, obviously, but uh, the danger for Israel if, is if multiple things happen at the same time. I don't think Hezbollah is quite in its position to, to attack, but that would be dangerous because of the weakness of Lebanon at the moment. But, but if it had to really deal with mass uprisings, uh, that would be a, a, a great uh, difficulty for Israel right. to, to handle. Without then, it, the danger for Israel is always then other nations then want to uh, intervene to, to restrain Israel. And then, and so she, she, it, it becomes very difficult for her. All right. Well, what we'll do, just to remind our viewers as well, uh, especially of those who are not watching much of the news, is what was happening uh, in, the, in recent days. And this is a CBN uh, report uh, that talks about the Iron Dome, the reason why there's the Iron Dome that, to protect Israel, and all the rockets that are coming uh, from Hamas, uh, and particularly from the Gaza Strip. Let's have a look at this, and then we'll come straight back to you live at revelationtv.com uh, and also the SMS, which will come on your screen in a few minutes so that you can take part in this live programming. Thank you. In the heaviest fighting since 2014, Hamas and other terror groups fired more than 1,000 rockets within a day and a half. It's the largest ever rocket fire on south and central Israel. The rocket salvos and the interceptions by the Iron Dome anti-missile system lit up the night sky over Tel Aviv in what looked like a Star Wars battle. Israel suspended flights from David Ben-Gurion Airport for an hour when rocket fire hit nearby. 
During the day, the skies over southern Israel witnessed the aerial battle between the rockets and the Iron Dome. The Israel Defense Force says the Iron Dome has shot down more than 90% of the rockets. Five Israelis have been killed by the rocket fire. All of these rockets were fired from densely populated civilian areas in Gaza by terrorists, blatantly disregarding human life and security of Palestinians and aiming to kill Israeli civilians. We are responding to Hamas's aggression by firing rockets at Israel, at our capital, and by forcing more than a million and a half Israeli civilians into shelter. In a campaign called Guardians of the Wall, Israel launched more than 500 surgical airstrikes to stop the rocket fire. Israeli Defense Minister Benny Gantz said they have many more targets to hit. 35 Palestinians have died in the attacks. The IDF says most of those were involved in the rocket attacks. The IDF has also killed several leaders of Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad. They toppled this building, housing Hamas offices. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu met with Israel's security cabinet. The conclusion of the meeting is to increase even more the force of the strikes and also the rate of the strikes. Hamas will now receive blows that it did not expect, and I know that this also involves patience and a certain sacrifice on your part, citizens of Israel. On Tuesday, the U.S. State Department weighed in on the fighting. Israel has the right to defend itself uh, and to respond to rocket attacks. The Palestinian people also have the right to safety and security, just as Israelis do. And the worst riots in more than 20 years rocked the Israeli town of Lod when Israeli Arabs rioted, burned synagogues, and set fire to dozens of cars. Israel declared a state of emergency, and the mayor called it a civil war. Inside Gaza, Hamas vowed to keep fighting, and its leader, Ismail Haniyeh, said it shifted the balance of power. The Palestinian Islamic Jihad posted this video thanking Iran for the new Badr III missile. It's another sign Iran is directly involved in this conflict. Last year, Iran's Supreme Leader Khamenei admitted for the first time his country was supplying weapons. He said Iran realized the Palestinian fighters' only problem was a lack of access to weapons. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. I just want to say, Derek, that, you know, it might be good for some of our viewers that perhaps they're just switching in tonight uh, and for the first time switching on to uh, Revelation TV. Let's have a, a quick pre uh, of what uh, the history of Israel is and its significance and why we shouldn't be, if you like, jumping on the bandwagon of being anti-Israel. Um, and not because uh, Israel hasn't got a history uh, that is spotless in any way. I was reading, for example, today um, uh, in the Book of Kings, and the time uh, that uh, each king that was in succession in, in Israel's history, uh, I'm talking, you know, two, 3,000 years ago, uh, was that uh, they failed. They failed to follow God's laws. They failed to, to, to honor God and respect God. And yet he allowed uh, for the kings to be uh, in existence. Some kings were good, like, um, uh, what was his name, Josiah, um, and people like that. But, you know, on, on mass, Israel seems to, uh, in historical terms, uh, not always be... Uh, on the money or righteous in God's eyes, but yet he made a covenant with Israel regardless of what they did or do. Even today to some people that is mindset, they would say that Israel is wrong and has no right to do what it is. It even has no right to be in the land. And yet this is totally contrary uh, to what God's word says, that Israel has a right to be there, why is it and what is it that you could help our viewers to uh, sort of grasp a nutshell uh, in a few minutes? Yes, um, if you believe God's word, the Bible, um, and not just the New Testament, but the Old Testament too, it's very clear that um, God chose Abraham, Isaac and Jacob um, and made a covenant with them. And, and of course, Jacob's name changed to Israel. So the, the nation of Israel are the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God made a covenant with Israel. Uh, or it's called the Abrahamic covenant. And this covenant covered a, a number of things. But in particular, it promised Israel would be a nation that would have a land called their promised land. And God covenanted with Israel 
to give them this land forever for as their land. And it was called an everlasting covenant. It's what's called an unconditional covenant that stands on the promise of God. So it doesn't, ultimately, the covenant doesn't depend on their good behavior. Now, a bit like us, we're in the new covenant. It's an everlasting covenant. And it guarantees the ultimate outcome. But if we do, if we sin, like Israel sinned and rebelled everyone sinned. Mm -hmm. you know what i mean but mm -hmm. israel did sin as you pointed out now that that meant that for periods of time they weren't they couldn't possess the land they they couldn't enjoy the land because of their sin and uh, they were off they were cast out of the land for more than one occasion but the covenant start, stood Regardless. on the grace of god on the promise of god because it's called an everlasting covenant and so even when they sinned you know, God still covenanted that land to them. And, um, and so you see it confirmed with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. A, a good summary of those, um, Psalm 105, rather, verse 7 to 11. It says, He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever. The word which he commanded for a thousand generations, which essentially is mm -hmm. to the end of time, uh, the covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac and confirmed it to Jacob for a statute to Israel as an everlasting covenant saying to you I will give the land of Canaan as the allotment of your inheritance. So God has covenanted the land to Israel. Basically God is the owner of the whole earth. And therefore, he can dispose of the different territories as he sees fit. And so he has covenanted this land to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And uh, Romans 11.29 says, the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. In other words, God doesn't change his mind. The, this covenant still stands. Now, the Abrahamic covenant, actually, which includes the land covenant, um, must be fulfilled. And it, it, and why? It, because God, if God is true, he must fulfill it. And ultimately, we believe it will be fulfilled in the millennium, in the, fully fulfilled, that is, in the, in the, in the thousand-year reign of Christ. All these covenants will come to their fullness. But right now, these covenants are actually what govern the, the outworking of history. Uh, one part of the covenant prophesied the coming of Christ, the Messiah, the Davidic covenant the, the, where he would come and reign as king. That's why I'm another part why. of the covenant mm. covered our salvation, that the bless what we call the blessing of Abraham, not just for Israel, but for all the nations. But another part of the covenant was her nationhood and the land. Now, the interesting thing is that in Deuteronomy 29, most people don't realize this, but after the law of Moses was given, which finished in Deuteronomy 28. God made another covenant through Moses called the land covenant, where he was confirming the Abrahamic covenant, but adding more detail. And in Deuteronomy 29, this is the kind of key to understand the present time. It says, these are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab, besides the covenant that he made with them at Horeb. That's Mount Sinai. Mm -hmm. And then he goes on and says, um, basically, Abraham has promised the land, but Moses prophesies in this, in this, as you read on, that Israel's going to sin and she's going to be cast out of her land. He's looking thousands of years ahead. And that's, of course, what happened. When Israel rejected Christ as the Messiah, she was cast out of her land because of that sin. And uh, she'd been scattered to the nations. So what happened in the church history is, uh, for some time, uh, after a time, the Christians decided, oh, God's clearly finished with Israel. That's it. Mm -hmm. We've replaced Israel. And that's replacement theology. And, um, and yet this prophecy says, y y although they'll be scattered, the, this land covenant is still in force. Right. And it, and it goes on. important, yeah. isn't it? Because exactly. it, this is why people get really upset because they think that the Palestinians have been uh, uh, denied their, uh, a place for them to live. When really, when you look at it historically, you can see that even going all the way back to Abraham and uh, to uh, Ishmael, 
You know, Ishmael uh, was the, the son that was brought through Hagar, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, and even though the promise actually, the Abrahamic promise was for uh, Israel through mm -hmm. Jacob, yeah. um, you know, Ishmael was going to have indeed uh, promises that were going to be fulfilled and have been fulfilled, mm -hmm. but it doesn't include the land. No. This is the thing, exactly. and this is why people and don't understand the, the Palestinian situation. Yeah. Yes. It, Israel has a relatively small piece of land compared to all the, the other lands yeah. around. But nevertheless, the reason that God has promised this land, it's at the center of the earth because God has chosen Israel to fulfill his purposes. Yeah. And, and that, that, that makes Israel the center of a great spiritual warfare because Satan knows, for Absolutely. example, that for God's plan to succeed requires Israel. Mm -hmm. to the fulfillment of the covenants to Israel. So if Satan can destroy Israel, uh, he, can, he thinks he can stop God's plan come to pass. So it, that's why Israel is always at the center of the spiritual warfare. Mm -hmm. and, and going back to Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy 30, Moses says, you know, the Lord will bring you back from ca your captivity and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations. So he says they'll be scattered to the nations and the Christians think, oh, well, they're scattered, so they finished. But no, God's predicted this ahead of time. They'll be scattered, but God will gather them again. And it says, wherever you're driven out from every part under heaven, from there the Lord will gather you, and he will bring you back to the land which your fathers possessed, and you will possess it, and you will prosper in that land. So the regathering of Israel was prophesied. And Jesus even prophesied it. In fact, the whole, all the Bible prophecies of the end times prophesy it because if you look at the prophecies of the end times and all the stuff leading up to Armageddon and Jesus' return, it's all centered on Israel. Mm -hmm. I mean, Jesus doesn't return to London. He returns to the Mount of Olives. So Israel's the center of the action. Where are the armies of Armageddon gathered to? Yeah, Israel. To Israel. Mm -hmm. Why? Because there is a nation again See, the Bible predicts that they'll be regathered and then there'll be some hard times that they go through, but God is bringing them back. He's setting the stage for the end time events to play out, which center on the nation of Israel. And in particular, these events are ultimately going to bring Israel to repentance. They're going to come to a place of believing in Jesus as their Messiah. And at, when they call on Jesus, he's going to return in the second coming. And so the whole future is predicated, as far as Bible prophecy is concerned, that Israel must be regathered to the land before the Lord returns. Okay. And that has happened, of course, in the last century, 1948, particularly the rebirth of Israel, which is a, we're about on the anniversary of it, just past May 14, 15. 73 years ago, and um, that was a major milestone in Bible prophecy. That was predicted. And, and, and then the 67 war, the recapture of the old city of Jerusalem, that was predicted by Jesus in Luke 21, 24. He said, uh, you'll be scattered to the nations until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Yeah. And so we are, enter we are in the kind of end time scenario uh, and that's why what happens around Israel is very significant. Right. See, for me, and unlike uh, many others who somehow um, historically over the, let's say, the last 150 years have been waiting for Israel to come back into the land, which they did in 48, as you're saying, but, you know, a lot of people are moved by the, what they see with the Palestinians who look like the ones who are suffering the most in all of this and that they're, they're dispossessed of a land when really, historically, it was always the Jewish people that were in the land uh, for thousands of years. Now, yes. we know they went into exile uh, at the time of Babylon, but that was for 70 years. Uh, God prophesied that came out of that, and just like today, when Israel is going through all that it's going through, uh, and especially some Christians, they still haven't grasped the significance of the restoration of Israel, and the reason why it has to be in place, has to be in the land, and there is this animosity between the, the Arabs, uh, particularly Palestinians, and 
Iran. Why is it Iran has such hatred for Israel and wants to see it pushed into the sea? Why? Explain to our viewers what that is. Well, the, the, the issue is, is probably more to do with Islam, you see, um, because it, 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 the Persians, the Iranians, are not actually Arab, you know. Uh, but the, the problem is that in the Islamic doctrine, um, obviously believing that they are the, you know, God's final religion, if you like, um, part of their doctrine is that once Islam has conquered a territory, um, then it belongs, you know, to Islam. Forever. To the, uh, forever. So Without a covenant from the living of course, God. they were under the Ottoman Empire which was mm. you know, broke up and uh, we have Turkey b was the center of it. But the Ottoman Empire took in. Now, there never was a Palestinian nation as such, but there was this o Ottoman Empire and there were Arabs living in the land as part of the Ottoman Empire. When the settl Jewish settlers came, a lot more Ar Arabs came because, you know, they provided work and so on. But it w there never was a Palestinian nation, but it was under... Islam for a few hundred years. So the fact that a Jewish state might be reborn there, where Islam once ruled, is a kind of rebuke to Islam. It's an insult to Islam, you might say, because, you know, and, and therefore it, it, it's very much, uh, especially the radical Islam, they hate Israel because it seems like that Israel is a defiant thing against Islam and therefore should be conquered. Mm. Um, while Israel stands, it's a witness that Allah is not the true God, you see, and, and so that is a threat to them. The irony is it's so clear in the New Testament, in Romans chapters 10 and 11 particularly, when I read them for myself, I didn't have anybody influence me, and when I read that this is a sacred secret, this was the rendition I was reading of the Bible, and, it, and I thought, what is this sacred secret? And it says God did not reject his people, the Jews. In fact, it is uh, for us as Christians not to become haughty or arrogant that we think we've replaced them uh, as the church of, uh, and the representative of God. No, we are grafted into the tree, the olive tree, and we could just as easily be locked off. That's what got me, Derek. And I actually got into my little van and drove to Israel mm. um, and spent months there trying to find out what it was, how God had made this covenant, try to find out and understand the mindset of the Jewish people, which is very difficult. But nevertheless, as a Gentile, I, I was interested to know my position under that covenant arrangement that God has not rejected his people and he's going to restore them, but he's going to bless us as Gentiles through the Jewish people and indeed the world. Genesis chapter 12. Uh, that covenant there, that Israel would be a blessing to the nations. And uh, yet everybody seems to see, well, not everybody, people see it, Israel, as a curse. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's so, it's so sad to see that. And this animosity that has grown uh, from when you read the history of Esther, in the book of Esther, about uh, how uh, Persia really felt about the Jews, you can see that's inherent and it's in the state mind uh, of Iran to actually see Israel wiped out, or the Jews, to be wiped out yet again, where they failed uh, two and a half thousand years ago. Mm. I mean, anti-Semitism, you know, is a, is a spirit from hell. Because, as I say, Satan wants to destroy Israel, wants to destroy the Jews, because that's his way of defeating God. And um, it's important that we, we understand where it comes from, where, you know, and, and so, we need to understand it's not just um, a rational thing. There, there's a spiritual power here, and which is why all kinds of people, whether far left, far right, you know, uh, different religions and so on, or even within the Christian world, has been very guilty of anti-Semitism. You know, saying that they are responsible for killing Christ and so on, and and so why is it? Why is this? It's, there's racism of all kinds, we understand that, but there, there's something unique about anti-Semitism in, in the way it's so widespread. Mm. Um, but it can only be understood spiritually. That, that's why you need to read the, the scriptures, and, and I'm pleased that I actually went to the extent of actually well, digging you, deep. You didn't have the theological baggage, you know what I mean? See, a lot of people in the church interpret the Bible 
through, you know, it has been passed on through church tradition. What happened really is that people stopped taking the whole Bible literally, and instead they just read it through the eyes of the of the salvation message of the New Testament. They reduced everything to this narrow thing, which was most important yeah. of our salvation. So mm -hmm. in their thinking, this is the normal Christian, mm -hmm. if you like, all that matters is Jesus died for my sins and I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, and, and the rest of the Bible is kind of irrelevant. And so they, they don't look seriously at the Old Testament and the replacement theologians will come along and kind of say, well, Jesus fulfilled all that, it's irrelevant. Mm. But I, I always love going back to the words of th God spoke through Balaam. You know, th this is so strong, where in Numbers 23, 19, he says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do it? Has, or has he spoken and will he not make it good? Behold, I have received a command to bless Israel. He has blessed and I cannot reverse it. And so we either take God at his word or we don't. You know, a lot of people think that the Old Testament, they, they reject it as the word of God. But Jesus said he, he came to fulfill. And that he said the scripture, which is the Old Testament, cannot be broken. In other words, it must be fulfilled. So salvation's important, but it's part of a bigger thing that God is doing of bringing his purposes to pass. And Israel is very much a, a, a key player in that game. Why is it a key player? Why is it important for all of us to recognize Israel's place in God's plan and at the same time in these end time uh, days that we're living in? From a personal point of view, when God said to Abraham, I, I will bless you and make your name great, and those who bless you will be blessed, and those who curse you, which literally means count you as unimportant, mm -hmm. count you as nothing, mm -hmm. shall be cursed. Uh, that God won't count them as anything. You see, your attitude to Israel is, is the test of a true believer. And Romans 9 to 11 talks about this. You know, because the New Testament actually does in certain places, mostly it takes the Old Testament for granted. It, it assumes that you've read right. the Old Testament, yep. you understand its message, it doesn't need to repeat it. But it does, as far as Israel is concerned, in Romans 9 to 11. And, and, it, and it basically says that Gentiles who, who speak, who boast against Israel, will come under a, a curse, a cutting off of God. And so God wants to, um, if, I, I put it like this, um, the, if the love of God has been shed abroad in our heart, and God says in Jeremiah 31, 3, I, I have loved you with an everlasting love, and he's talking about his love for Israel. God loves Israel with an everlasting love. Then if God's love is shed abroad in our heart, then we will have a love for Israel not based necessarily on that they are perfect, but based on the fact that God's, God's love for Israel is in our heart. And so uh, some, if there's a Christian who hates Israel, um, I, I have to question, you know, their salvation. And that might seem a bit strong. But let me make it clear, we're not endorsing everything Israel does. For instance, the biblical attitude is that the land belongs to God and he has given it to Israel. Um, now, Israel are having troubles in the land because of their sin, you know? And God actually promises Israel that once they repent of their sin, then they will enjoy the blessing and the peace. But until then, they will have trouble. And one of the commands to Israel is, you know, uh, the strangers in the land, you should treat them well. Mm -hmm. You know, so, it, you know, I'm, I'm not one to judge because it's quite hard because of the religion of Islam that is hostile to Israel. It's difficult for them, you know, to, to uh, you know, they, they can look like an oppressor sometimes, but often they're just defending themselves against this hostile um, entity. But um, nevertheless, they are responsible, even though it is their land, they are responsible to treat the strangers well, and God does hold them accountable to that. Mm. So, but we have to see the situation through the biblical eyes if we want to see them correct. And of course, that's what believers should do if they are Absolutely. believers. Did it help then, I'm going to go read these emails. Okay. Did it help 
by me reading uh, the Old Testament first, and then when I got to Romans, I understood a little bit more. Was, did the yeah. penny drop with me yeah. because I'd started in that order rather than just Absolutely. starting with the New I, Testament? I liken it like this. You're, if you read a novel, all right, you read the first half of the novel, and there's lots of things you don't really understand how yeah. it's going to work mm -hmm. out. And as you read on, then you read the second half of the novel, which is the New Testament, and it, it brings a lot of things together, all right? Now, what a lot of people do is say, well, look, the, the New Testament is, gives us clearer knowledge, so therefore we need to, re we need to rewrite the Old Testament to, you know, to make it conform. So, um, you know, and, and people actually think that somehow the Old Testament history and the covenants with Abraham no longer apply as if Jesus somehow cancelled them out or fulfilled them, mm. but actually they stand. Yeah. And um, if you understand that, you see that the Bible is quite Israel-centric. Right. And then you read Romans, and that just confirms that and clarifies that. Yes. So right. absolutely. Right. Okay, uh, <laughs> lots of emails coming in. Les writes in and says, two questions, Derek. Do you think the present situation in Israel could lead to the invasion in which God intervenes and the dead of the invading armies are buried uh, by Israel over a period of several years. I remember that scripture, yeah. It says also, do you have any views about the asteroid that could impact the planet Earth in 2028? 2029, I think it is. Yeah. Yes. Well, anyway, I'm glad, particularly for the first question, because yeah. I was going to mention this. I've actually written a book on the Ezekiel invasion, Ezekiel 38, the imminent invasion of Israel. Right. And um, basically everything's in line and it basically predicts there will be an invasion of the mountains of Israel, which is the disputed occupied territories, um, led by Russia, Iran and Turkey. And, and we see these nations getting aligned and resisted by Tarshish and her young lions, which I believe is the UK and America and the Allied nations, as it were, and also resisted by the Gulf states, Saudi Arabia and so on, which is the exact political alignment right now. And, um, but there has to be a, cat, you know, it could happen at any time. All the pieces are in position, but we need a catalyst for it to happen. And what would that be? Now, I thought it would be if Israel, and it might be, will take out the Iranian nuclear facilities to stop them build a nuclear mm. bomb. That could be a big enough act that, to cause Russia to say, we need to teach Israel a lesson. They would move in with... And then they would do like America did with Iraq, build an international coalition of mm -hmm. mostly Muslim countries who they would rejoice at this opportunity and attack Israel. Or what I thought would happen when um, President Trump was there trying to put his plan together, uh, and Israel would annex the West Bank. And that would trigger... But in this recent conflict, it suddenly occurred to me, this, something like this could also be the trigger. So I agree with this person that something like this, if there was a big Arab uprising, particularly in the West Bank, okay, and Israel really had to come in strong and to try and pull it down, then um, that could trigger this invasion and, and it's interesting that President Erdogan of Turkey actually, uh, it was reported, had approached Putin and tr said to him, we need to teach Israel a lesson. We need to put together an international force that will actually go in and protect the Palestinians. So pretty much like what he's which done is, for Assad, really, as well. Which is Ezekiel 38, yes. In other words, this international force will go in. Now, it will be in the name of protecting the Palestinians, but it will be just the type of thing that, it, that Russia and Turkey has already done, and Iran, in Syria. You see, you go in, to, in, the, in the name of doing a good job, but what you're actually doing is strengthening your, your military footprint and control of the region. So this would be a great opportunity. The Bible describes it like a hook in the jaw. It's a great opportunity for these nations to, to control the Middle East by, by actually going in. So some situation will arise that will tempt them to go in and have the kind of world support because everyone will think, you know, the Pal these Palestinians need protecting. And so, 
you could see that a situation like this, if it really blew up much more, could lead to that. You know, Turkey would be raring to do it. Iran would be raring to do it. They wouldn't dare to do it without Russia's cover. Mm. But at some point, God says he'll do it. And when he does it, when they do that, it's going to be a big event because God's going to step in and take action. And it's interesting talking about what we're talking about. He, in verse 14, Ezekiel 38, 14, on that day when my people Israel dwell safely, will you not know? So God says, they're still my people. They're in unbelief, but they're still my people. And then he says, they have attacked my land. God says, my land, verse 16 and 21. In other words, it's a covenant land. And God says, I'm going to fight. And God goes to war and he sends an earthquake and he destroys. Anyway, read my book if you want to find out what happens. Yeah. And it One triggers of a worldwide revival. And the book in particular is? Yeah, The Imminent Invasion of Israel. You can get it from uh, Oxford Bible Church. .co.uk or from Amazon and we need to be ready for this because it's going to when God demonstrates his power he's going to show that there is a the God of Israel the God of the Bible is is still very much alive and it will be a great chance to share the gospel right okay lots of emails let's see if we can get through <coughs> as many as we can uh, the seven year peace treaty this is Satinda who's saying greetings to you both could you uh, could the proposed Israeli-Palestinian two-state solution be the seven-year peace treaty? Um, it, it's possible that that will be part of it. It will also, uh, according to Revelation 11, it will also, which will be brokered by the Antichrist. Um, I, I, I don't think so, actually. I don't think so. What it will do, it will split the Temple Mount. Uh, and it will allow the Jews to build their temple and and the other half will belong to the Gentiles, to, to, to the Muslims. Mm -hmm. um, the, moment, the reason I say I don't believe that is that at mid-tribulation, halfway through the seven years, the Antichrist actually invades and takes over the temple and he takes over Judea, Samaria, because because they're told to flee. Anyone living in Judea, flee to the mountains. So in other words, he's going to come in and take possession and of the West Bank himself. Yeah. And the problem is that Israel, it would be undefendable if it doesn't have control of the West Bank. And then stage two of his plan is Armageddon, which is to totally an annihilate Israel. So I'm not sure exactly what the peace treaty is, but I, I'm not sure. Mm. Okay, um, this is from Margaret. It says that, hi guys, always love the show with Derek. I wonder uh, if this is the precursor to Psalm 83, Maggie. I don't believe so. I believe Psalm 83 is not a specific battle, but it actually describes the situation since 1948. It describes this confederacy of nations surrounding Israel who, who seek her destruction. And so the multiple wars since 1948 um, is, is actually a fulfillment of Psalm uh, 83. And, and the hints in 83 is that it, it is the, um, it's Israel forces that, that defeat the enemy. And so Psalm 83 is simply a prayer for, for Israel to have victory over these enemies that try and destroy her. Now, the enemies named are the inner circle surrounding Israel, and they're basically broken now. They, they, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, they have no power. They're not the threat. The inner circle's not the threat. So I don't see it, Psalm 83 at all. That's already happened. The real threat is the outer ring, which is Turkey, Iran. And Iran. And, and even Russia. Right. Okay. Uh, this is from Glenda. Lebanon, Hamas are now trying to get involved, but bombs have landed inside Lebanon. Uh, Israel has targeted the place where the bombs came from, uh, praying for the peace of Jerusalem and for his supernatural arm of protection over Israel, says Glenda. Okay, thank you. Um, James says, hi, guys. Here's the title deeds of the land of Israel. Leviticus chapter uh, 25 in uh, 23, I don't know if that's the verses, the land must not be sold permanently, reads the scripture here, because the land is mine and you reside in my land as foreigners and as strangers. 
And the Word of God tells us that the land irrevocably belongs to the Lord, pretty much what you were saying earlier, Derek. Uh, nowhere do we read that the Lord has sold it, or really, may I add, passed it on to others. But uh, many thanks, James. Yeah. Thank you for highlighting that. The heading here. Good evening, Howard and Derek. Great discussion. A friend posted this. Haven't had time to check its accuracy, uh, but it looks correct. Thought you'd like it. Uh, is Israel occupying Palestinian lands? This is a question. Uh, this is the people interested in real history and not modern fables. Before the state of Israel, there was the British Mandate, not a Palestinian state. Before the British Mandate, there was the Ottoman Empire, not a Palestinian state. Before the Ottoman Empire, there was an Islamic state of Egypt's rompers, not a Palestinian state. Before the Islamic state of Egypt's rompers, there was the Ayyub Arab Kurdish Empire, not a Palestinian state. Before the Ayyub Empire, I'm not pronouncing that properly, probably, uh, there was the Frankish Christian uh, Kingdom of Jerusalem, not a Palestinian state. Before the Frankish, he goes on and on and on, but it goes all the way back in history uh, to the point that, making the point that really there was never a Palestinian state. That's it. So how? It's a modern myth. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. There's never any coinage. There's never any history of uh, uh, statehood, mm -hmm. um, but there has been for Israel. And the significance is that it actually is going to form part of God's end time purposes and to be a blessing to all the nations. They're just um, kicking at the gold here. I, I may add. Uh, Paul. Yes, you see, Satan knows that Jesus is going to return to Jerusalem and set up his kingdom from there. So therefore, that is the crux of the issue. And therefore, he needs to try and wipe Israel out and, and undermine its even right to exist. And, and therefore, we should, um, if, we, if we know the truth, we, we should fight for Israel's right to existence. We are not saying Israel is right in everything it does. In fact, it is not in fellowship with God, but nevertheless, its election stands by the grace of God. And um, it's a very important point for us that Paul makes in Romans 8, actually. He, he says, you know, we, we stand in the election of God. We are sinned. We've, we've sinned. But we are going to be saved because we trust in Christ. But if Christ could break his promise to Israel, his unconditional promise and covenant to Israel, how can we be so sure that he won't break his promise to us? Mm. See, our salvation stands on whether Israel mm. stands. If Israel is destroyed, then our salvation has no basis because we both stand on the co covenant. faithful covenant-keeping God. Amen. And uh, so we, we, uh, we, we should um, put our trust in him and he, he, he will keep his God over Israel. Okay, uh, reading more as well, the new covenant, um, this is, it is finished. Uh, Jesus came to fulfill the old covenant and he did. The new covenant could not begin until the old was fulfilled, every jot and tittle. And uh, Acts 2, the believers baptized the Holy Spirit and they sold their lands. Uh, it's going on, I'm trying to get to the point, not one stone left, 70 AD, the temple. Again, going over the history of the Jews. It is important to say, I, I'm not sure if that's what, what they're saying, but there's a difference between the Abrahamic covenant and what's called the old covenant. Galatians 3 makes this mm. clear. The Abrahamic covenant is everlasting. But then when the covenant that God made with Moses, which we call the old covenant, was added afterwards, okay, it did not cancel the Abrahamic covenant, but it was a preparation for the new covenant. But then, but the old covenant of Moses has come to an end, yes, and it's been replaced by the new covenant. But that does not mean the Abrahamic covenant, because we, we are under the blessing of Abraham now. We, the new covenant is a fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. So if, if, they, if they're saying, well, the old covenant's finished, so therefore the, old, the whole Old Testament is irrelevant now, that's false. The Abrahamic covenant is still in force. Mm. Uh, Liz pretty much says, um, as a 70-year-old, uh, pretty much where I was at as well, why are the new Christians encouraged to read the New Testament first? When I went to school, now in my 70s, we started with the Old Testament, says Liz, absolutely. Um, Israel is the title here, Dear Revelation TV, Israel will be special to God again in the future, but at this time, um, oh, are not so low, Ami, 
uh, not my people. Kind regards, Jim. Do you know what he's getting at? No lie, well, honey? He's talking about the fact that Israel are out of fellowship as a whole. Although the number of Messianic Jews is increasing, as a whole, the nation of Israel is still out of fellowship. And that's why, and she will continue to have troubles because of that. Um, because, but the, the important thing is that she does have a covenant with God. And in that covenant, God guarantees that she will come to faith and she will come into the full possession of her land. And the current state is in fulfillment of prophecy. God said, I am going to regather her as a nation again, and then I will deal with her in the land and eventually come to faith. So we need to understand that Israel not only has the right to exist, but she exists by God's command. It's not an accident that Israel became a nation in 1948. That, that was the hand of God. Not because she deserved it, but by the grace of God. And so if we're on God's side, as it were, we, we should support the existence of Israel. But at the same time, we're not pretending that they are, they are in the fulfillment of what they should be. But we should be praying for them for their salvation, that they become the people that God intended them to be. And when they do, then as you said, the whole earth will be blessed. In the millennium, a saved Israel will bless the whole world. So uh, just because they're not in fellowship with God doesn't mean that God doesn't love them and that God doesn't have a purpose for their life and that they are not center stage as far as the world history and the events are concerned, because they are. Israel, how, um, how did they love the program? Did any of the Jewish people take the land of Israel illegally by man's standards? Yes or no? Let me ask you that right now. Did well, I, I don't know all the, the detail, but I, I believe they bought, when they returned, if you're talking about the recent settlers, they, mm. they actually uh, bought up the well, the land they from, were from the locals. Yeah, but the land that was originally given to Israel was far more than what it is today. It extended oh, into yeah. Jordan. It yeah. extended into the Golan Heights, yeah. and also further south. Israel has shrunk uh, over the years, and over the last seventy years, more than uh, it had been uh, when. Yes, it, it was, was promised given to under it. the mandate to be much larger. Yeah, and, and then it, what was promised to them was divided into an Arab state, which is Jordan, and then Israel. Uh, and then she was even given less than that, so... Derek, anything you can actually round off and sort of say, right, this is why Israel is significant to uh, the world, never alone, ne let alone to Christians. Well, Romans 11 says that when Israel is restored, um, the whole world will be blessed. So God has so chosen things that that Israel is the key to the blessing of the whole world. And therefore, the, the th with, you know, with all our political analysis, what really matters as Christians is we should be praying for Israel, praying for the Arabs and the Jews, of course, for their salvation. Because, but realizing that Israel is under a particular spiritual attack, and therefore it's right that we pray for them, that God opens their eyes, that they receive their Messiah, and, and that, in the end, is the key to the destiny of the whole world. And, and so we, we're praying for God's kingdom to come, and it will come through Israel. Mm -hmm. God, Jesus cannot return until Israel says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So the whole return of Christ is predicated on Israel coming to faith. So whatever else we do, we should be praying for Israel's salvation. Amen. But also the Arabs and, and mm. all the peoples. Yeah, God's will and purpose is for all people to be yeah. uh, come to know him. And indeed, the prophecy in Isaiah is so lovely and it's so reassuring to Arab, Jew, uh, Gentile, because they're all going to be led to, the, uh, to serve the living God um, and they are all going to be acceptable and worship God uh, between all of us, and that peace that's going to be coming uh, will be something, uh, as promised, that will be such a blessing to all the nations. That's why we can't miss the purposes of God, and particularly at this moment in time, for Israel to be something that is not a curse word and not uh, anything but a blessing, even though they themselves don't recognize fully why they are in that position, um, and uh, they are coming to a knowledge 
of who their Messiah is, uh, little by little. And I just want to say thank you to you, Derek Walker, thank uh, you. for being a blessing to us and stepping in tonight at the last minute. And also to you. Thank you. God bless. Bye-bye. Five, four, three.